And we, we are midway through our current series in Mark's Gospel. And it's a series that has, um, has been challenging. It's brought words of great comfort. It's brought some phenomenal surprises. And I have no doubt that today will be no different to that. But Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 52, and anointed, I'll let you start. The twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later he will rise. Then James... Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want, for me to, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I am baptised. I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indigenous with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave for all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm reading from 46. Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and and Jesus as his disciple together was with a large crowd, a large crowd. We are leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timadius, called, was singing by the roadside, begging. When Jesus heard it, when Jesus heard it, it was of it was of Nazareth. He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to, to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called him to, they called him to the blind man. Cheer up on your feet. He is, he is calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want, you, I want to see. Go, Jesus said. Your faith has hid you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Praise the Lord. Well, hi, everybody. Um, please could you draw your conversations together to a close. Why don't I pray for us? And then we'll launch right into this passage. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that your word is able to point our hearts towards Jesus. It's able to reveal to us our need for him, how he is the answer to all of our struggles and all of our longings, how we can enjoy life to the fullest as we trust in what he has done at the cross and see how he is reigning on high right now. It's in your name that we pray that we would rejoice in these truths. Amen. Well, let me start with a question for you. What do you want? Or maybe another way of putting it is, what are your life goals for the next 10 years? It's kind of fun, because when I get to ask a question like that, I can see all of your faces, so you're all looking at me, and you all went straight down, because it's a tough question to answer, isn't it? It's a difficult one for us to, to get straight away. Let me give you a couple of them that I found on the internet that people answered. Some Christians who were polled said, in the next 10 years or their life goals, they'd love to buy a home, start a business, find out who they really are, care for the poor and needy, 
and maybe some of those resonate with you, but what's just really interesting is, again, mostly with people who are hearing the word of God, they feel a bit awkward about articulating what they want. Feel a little bit like it's a bit of a funny thing to say. Some of us might even think, well, actually, we want wrong things at times. And so if we want wrong things, and that causes unhelpful things to happen, that causes sin to go around, then we need to be careful about talking about what we want. Maybe that is the problem that's around. Our culture's starting to think about that a little bit. It's gone from saying, it's all about whatever you want, do whatever you want, make that your identity, to now saying that if you do that too much, that can be really devastating, because when you don't get what you want, then you get an identity crisis. I think most recently of an article in 2021 by the BBC, where a psychology professor called Anne Wilson said, for most of us, if we tie our identity to what we do and what we want to do, we'll get an identity crisis when it doesn't go the way that we want. But what's interesting is, here, in this passage, Jesus asks that question to the disciples. He asks that question to Bartimaeus. Do you see that? He says, what can I do for you? And that's something that's really helpful for us because actually going to God and articulating what we want is a good thing. Knowing what we want so that we can aim for it, so that we can work at trying to achieve it, so that if it is wrong, we can reshape it and work it through is a good thing. But we're never going to get there if we don't know what we want, which is why we talk about the things that we want. It's why City Church doesn't just say we want to enjoy life to the fullest with Christ. We talk about a 10-year vision of wanting to plant two churches, of wanting to grow to a number where we can continually plant without being um, some, a church that can't recover. We, we talk about our goals. It's why schools don't just have wonderful ethoses that say, carpe diem, we will seize the day, we will learn and our, we will educate our future. They, they have yearly stats and goals about how those children are doing because it's important to know how things are progressing. It's why our wonderful NHS doesn't just say it has a mission statement to help you be healthy and happy, and if you cannot be healthy and happy, to care for you as best as possible. There are yearly stats on to how long the waiting lists are, because again, we want to make sure that we can track progress, and we want to aim at something that's helpful there. So let me ask you again here, City Church, what do you want? What are your goals? If Jesus was to look at you and say, what can I do for you? How would you answer that question? I love that the Gospels give us these types of questions for our everyday lives that challenge us in these different ways. It's been so good going through the Gospel of Mark, and actually we love going through the Gospels, which is why last year we went through the Gospel of Luke, and at the beginning of City Church, we went through the Gospel of John. And sometimes when I chat to new Christians or non-Christians, the pushback and the question is, Eric, why so many Gospels? Aren't they all just saying the same thing? Aren't they just repeating themselves? Why, why are we going through this again and again? And the wonderful thing to note is that the Gospels, each of those Gospel writers, has a different personality, a different way of communicating the truth of who Jesus is, a different way of helping us engage and delight in God. Just in the same way that we have a diverse staff team of people who are very, very different, and each of them have different spiritual gifts different ways of helping you, equipping you as a church to delight in God all the more. I mean, my wife and I played a little game like this afterwards because we're really cool and talked about church in our spare time and sermons and, and, and which one of the staff team would be each sermon series. So we started off with the Gospel of Luke and our Luke series. Luke's a writer who is incisive, methodical, to the point, deep in its details. Who, who would that be in our staff team? Oh, of course, it's Ralph. That would be who, who we'd imagine that to be. And then we went to the Gospel of John from a few years ago that we did. Gospel of John is an out-of-the-box thinker, full of drama, going, where are you leading me? Where is this going? You all know where it is. It's Matt. And then I, I turned to my wife and went, hmm, interesting. So, so if, if I was a Gospel sweetheart, what would I be? And Claire went, no question, Mark. And I was thinking, because I'm to the point, I'm straight for it. And she went, no, no, no because it's short, <laughs> okay, um, but, but I mean, you know, in the Gospel of Mark, it says immediately, again, immediately, 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 it's short, it's to the point, it's straight there, it's taking you through stuff, it's bish, bash, bosh, it's business-like, business-like. I would have got offended at being told I was business-like, but one of my church members 
<laughs> a couple of weeks ago, just in a very lovely way, told me I was businesslike. And I, I would tell you who that is, but I can't remember. She was just congregation member number 76 in my brain. So <laughs> there we go, businesslike it is. But that silly point aside, it does highlight something that we need to know as we go into this passage. Each of those gospels is not repeating stuff just for the sake of repeating stuff. In fact, the Gospel of John tells us that there is enough to fill libraries of all that Jesus has done, but they record very little in the Gospels to help us to know who God is and to delight in him. And so whenever a Gospel repeats something, it's really important, especially, especially in the Gospel of Mark, if it is bish, bash, bosh, straight to the point, going from one thing to another. And Mark takes great effort to repeat two different things today that should help us see how wonderful Jesus is and how we need to interact with him as well. Brings us to our first point. What does Jesus want? The first thing that Mark repeats is that Jesus is going to die. We get that in Mark chapter eight, we get it in chapter nine, and then we get that again here in chapter 10, verses 32 to 34. Jesus gives us more detail about what's gonna happen. He tells us he'll die in Jerusalem. He tells us that he'll be delivered over, that he'll be condemned to death, and that his death will be graphic and violent. They will mock, spit, and flog him. Mark is taking the time to slow down here, to repeat this, to emphasize that Jesus is predicting his death again and again and again, to tell us that this is the core mission for Jesus. He has come to die. Why? So that, in verse 45, he may give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus has not come to serve, to be served, sorry, but to die. He's about to give his life in a completely unique way, which makes him unique to every other religion and every other religious founder. Everybody else comes to be a leader. Jesus comes to be a servant and a sacrifice. And it tells us in verse 45 that he comes to give his life as a ransom for many. That word in the Greek for means in place of, a substitute. And that word ransom there is about paying a significant amount of money for somebody's freedom. Except humanity isn't just physical slaves. We are eternal spiritual slaves of sin. And so it's going to cost an eternal spiritual cost of our God giving up his life on a cross for us. Now, again, I can read your faces. So at this point, some of you who have been at church for a while think, what a wonderful truth. But on a week like this, when we've got baptisms, I know we've got visitors as well. And some of you might be thinking, that doesn't sound like a good God, Eric. That sounds like a selfish God, a bloodthirsty, grim God who needs a sacrifice. Why does God need to have somebody die? Why can't he just forgive everybody? Like, why is this God a good that is worth praising? Why have you all sung about how wonderful he is? Tim Keller is really helpful here in his book, um, King's Cross. He tells us that all life-changing love involves substitutionary sacrifice. All life-changing love involves substitutionary sacrifice. Or in normal people's speech, if if you really choose to love someone, it's going to cost you. I'll give you an example. I love my kids. I absolutely adore them. But they, they cost me. They cost me a lot. If I want them to flourish, I give them my time, my energy, my attention. I give them my best efforts. And it means that I don't get to do some of the things that I want to do. I don't go out in the evenings anymore and see friends because if I leave my children alone at home, it's considered illegal. There's there's some things that I have to do to change my life. I, I don't get to watch the things that I like anymore. I used to enjoy watching football. That was so fun and so interesting. Now I watch videos about how puppies are going to save the day. And it's not really as interesting for me. I used to read books that were fascinating and articles about footballers and things that I wanted to do. Now I read stories about dinosaurs pooping over Christmas or some other random thing, but it's not very interesting. I am not excited by any of these things, but I do them because I love them and it costs me. In fact, if I could do anything that I want in life, anything that I want, it would probably be to hang out with my wife, and my friends enjoying a craft beer somewhere in in Manchester in the city centre, laughing about how much free time we have, how much disposable income we have, and how in the morning we're just going to all sleep in and have have a lie-in because we're not going to get woken up at 10 o'clock in the morning by our children, or more likely seven. But that's not my life. I've got kids. And that means that that life for me is gone for the next 20 years. That dream, poof, 
kicked, punted, gone for 20 odd years. It's going to cost me, but it's worth it, isn't it? Because I love my kids and I want them to grow and I want them to flourish and I want them to do well. In fact, you all know that this is substitutionary sacrifice because if I don't pay that cost, then who's going to suffer? My kids. And we all know those parents who don't want to sacrifice for their kids. And actually, that leaves them struggling and it leaves a really sad taste in our mouths. In fact, I looked at an article this week that said that 60% of Americans now spend more time on their phones than they do with their kids. And wherever you stand on this stuff, you're probably all saying, that's probably not a good thing. You know, everything will cost us. Everything that we love will cost us. And we need to give ourselves to something that matters. And that is exactly what Jesus does here. What does he want to do? He wants to give up his life as a ransom for many. He wants to die on the cross and raise again, not because he's interested in being hurt, but because he loves and cares for us because we are his treasured possession. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a great cost that we see? The second point that we see, though, is not just what does Jesus want, what does Jesus want to do, but what do the disciples want to do as well? That's the second point. In fact, it's not just Jesus' death that is repeated again in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus, like we've said before, asks that question to both James and John and also to Bartimaeus. What can I do for you? And again, that's supposed to highlight to something, something to us that's really, really important. Jesus asks the disciples, what can I do for you? And this starts with the disciples asking Jesus a cheeky question, doesn't it? You see that at the beginning of this passage. They go, we want you to do whatever we ask. Now again, that's not a great way to approach God. Sometimes my six-year-old comes up to me and goes, Daddy, I want you to do whatever I ask. And the answer is always, no. It, you know, it's not a good start. In fact, it's so obviously not a good thing that I've had the pleasure of praying with you all for over a couple of years. I've never heard any of you pray like this. Oh Lord, creator of the heaven and earth, in control of everything, give me everything I want right now. Here's my list, point number one. I've never heard any of you pray that way because it would be weird, it would be odd. But don't you love how honest the gospels are? This is how James and John approach Jesus. James and John, the future leaders of the church. James and John, who have spent three years following Jesus. James and John, who have given up everything to follow Jesus. James and John, who have done great things under the command of the Lord, put a request in like this. Something so selfish, something so boneheaded, after God has already told them. Jesus has said he's going to die on a cross. They go, I want, give me everything that I want, please. And don't you just love how Jesus responds to this. It would be right for Jesus to go, that's not appropriate. It'd be right for Jesus to go, how dare you? Do you know what I'm gonna do to give up for you? I'm gonna die on the cross. It would be right for Jesus to, to rebuke them and to put them in their place. But what does Jesus say instead? What do you want me to do for you in verse 36? There's a kindness there, a willingness to listen to us as we have requests towards him. And how do James and John respond? Let us sit at your right and left in glory. James and John have not heard Jesus repeat again and again and again that he's going to die. They're just not listening. They're not interested in the humiliation and the shame of the cross. They're interested in the prestige and the honor of a crown. And so Jesus talks to them about the cup and the baptism he's going to face. In the Old Testament, a cup is always a description of God's wrath and judgment against evil. And Jesus uses the word baptism here to describe an immersion in God's wrath and judgment. It's showing the disciples how, again, they are unaware of what Jesus is saying and what he's wanting to do. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen those YouTube clips of, say, somebody who's going, you know, I want to be the next pop idol, or I want to be the next X Factor person, and they st you know, they're all excited, and then they start singing, and it's terrible, and you're like, ooh, they didn't get it, did they? It's kind of what's going on here with James and John. You know, they, they, they're just deluded about what's going on. You ever seen those comments from somebody who's you know, not really sure about what they want to do in life, a wash all over the place, and they're going, this is how to fix the world. These are the things you want to do. And you're like, you, 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 you've not even fixed your own life. How can you talk about what the government is doing wrong? They're a bit deluded. Well, again, this is what James and John seem to be doing, because they say to Jesus, we can take that cup. We can take that wrath. We can take all those difficulties. And you know what? At this point, it's really tempting for us to go, silly, silly James and John. What are you doing? You had the best education ever. You had three years of Jesus. How could you possibly be like this? But actually, this is to reveal to us again that this upside-down nature, this 
kingdom that God is establishing where he loves us and he sacrifices for us, where we are called to serve, it's a difficult thing for anyone to get our heads around. New Testament scholar Richard Hayes had the following to say about this section. Those who follow Jesus find themselves repeatedly failing to understand the will of God. There can be no space for smugness and dogmatism. Point being, whether you're a brand new Christian, someone who's walked 25 years with God, someone who has seen Jesus face to face and enjoyed him for three years, or someone who is a New Testament theologian who knows the books really, really well, all of us will struggle to live out this upside down kingdom where Jesus sacrifices himself for us, where he gives forgiveness, where he gives kindness. This is something that is difficult for us to know, which is why, again, Jesus explains his upside down kingdom, that the aim isn't to win power with force and influence over other people. Rather, the aim is to win people over with love. Jesus doesn't rule with oppression and power. He rather helps people and loves them and cares for them. He would be well within his right to, as, as he's on the cross, go, look at these people. They are selfish. They have not got a clue. Just destroy them. Angels, come down. Get rid of them all. We'll, we'll remake some new ones. We'll, we'll, we'll go over it again. Because we're all sinful. And we're all horrible. But he doesn't, does he? What does he do at the cross instead? He prays for us. Father, forgive. Forgive them. They know not what they're doing. And that's, that's the kingdom that we try to step into. That's the kingdom that James and John are going to be called into. What do they want? Power and prestige. How does Jesus help them see that real power is done by forgiveness and love? By showing what he's done at the cross. I'll give you an example of how this looks in our lives too. Some of you might have heard me give this example before. My, my wife grew up in India in a, um, in a school called Hebron. And it was like this tiny, tiny little school where, you know, the year group was like seven people. So everybody knew everybody. And there was a family there called the Staines um, with just this wonderful group of kids. Um, and they would travel to um, nearby communes and, and reach out to people and help them with leprosy. Graham would often bring his boys because he wanted to, them to see what it was like to be involved in missionary work. And one time, he stuck them in the car, and they drove towards the jungle, and they were going to go and help out a leprosy commune, but they thought they couldn't get there overnight, so they stayed in the car, and they slept overnight in the car. And then that night, 50 fundamentalist Hindus, led by the Barang Dal, came and burnt the car to ashes as they carried axes. They burnt Graham alive, and the kids, Timothy, age seven, and Philip, age 10, were killed for the gospel, leaving behind a distraught mother slash wife and a distraught sister slash daughter. And rather than go back to Australia, rather than seek justice and be infuriated at the people and call out Hindus, they chose to forgive. I quote her, we will forgive. Yes, I told my daughter we will forgive. Jesus Christ has forgiven my crimes, so he also commands us to forgive each other. I feel sad that I do not get to see my sons growing up, but Christ has been my companion. At times I miss my husband dearly, but God is my greatest support. When we forgive, there is no bitterness, and we live our lives and continue the task entrusted to us with his grace and peace. All Christians have known the intervention of Jesus in their lives and have this gift of forgiveness that we need to live out. Isn't that an incredible encouragement? And it's worth you knowing, it's worth you knowing, not all of those 50 fundamentalists, not all of those who were infuriated with the Christians changed and came to respond to the gospel. But some did, some did. We see we had one option, there was one option there, to seek revenge, to crush, to push down, to be the way of the world. And the other option was to choose to forgive. And in doing so, some hearts were changed to see how wonderful our Lord and our God and our Savior is, who is the first one to model this in choosing to die on the cross for us. What did the disciples want? Power. Where is real power demonstrated? At the cross, in the wrath and the suffering that Jesus faces. Last point. What does Bartimaeus want? Well, again, Bartimaeus is a blind beggar that is viewed as a nuisance. Bartimaeus is blind and begging at the side of the road, and it's likely that no one cares for him, which is why he's resorted to begging. Or he might 
be one of those whose family realized that if he begs in a busy place, he can earn a lot of money, and so they drop him off there at the beginning of a day, and then he begs for a bunch of hours, and then they pick him up at the end of the day, bring him home, and they split the proceeds. Either way, it's not a nice life to live, especially not at this time in Second Temple Judaism, because in this time, in this culture, people viewed that if you were blind, that was because you were a sinner. That was your judgment that you received from God. And so this person would likely have been not ignored, told he was a nuisance, and when he begged, some of the common responses would have been like, you get what you deserve, as people walk on by him. Do you know, actually, when you treat someone in that way, that negatively, when you reject someone, it's dehumanizing and horrible, isn't it? And it's crushing to the soul. Mike Leary, professor of psychology and neurology at Duke University notes, rejection takes a toll on people. People who routinely are excluded have poorer sleep quality, have poorer immune systems, and they will likely struggle more with health problems in the future. We can see that in academic research. But we can also see it with what we see here in Manchester. Do you know every year we have a church partner called Coffee for Craig. It's a homeless charity, a non-Christian charity, that reaches out to those in, in our city and looks to see how we can care for them. And every year, Rishi from Coffee for Craig talks to us. She talks to us about how we can give, how we can volunteer, how we can help, and how we can support. And there's always one thing that she says that sticks out with us. Because she doesn't just say, give your money. She doesn't just say, help and volunteer. We always go, what's the practical thing that we can also do? And she goes, everyone who's homeless in Manchester, if you can just, when you walk past them, smile at them, that will make a huge difference. Because all the time, all they see is people walking past them, looking at them like they're see-through, like they're empty, like they're worthless. But if they are valuable, then shouldn't you give them a smile and help them? That's a non-Christian telling us about the, the image of God and how so important somebody is. And it sticks with us that actually valuing somebody, seeing somebody as worthwhile is just incredibly important. And Bartimaeus knows this because he has had a life of being treated as lesser, as not important, as somebody to be rejected and pushed to the side. And so he heals this crowd making noise. He sees his chance to call out to Jesus and he shouts. He calls out to Jesus. In his pain, he's calling out and Jesus calls for Bartimaeus to come towards him. And then Bartimaeus tells Jesus what he wants to see. And Jesus responds by giving him sight. But do you see something that's even more wonderful here? Bartimaeus is constantly facing that daily trial of being shown that he is not valuable, that he has no worth, that he is lesser. He's always been pushed down, being viewed as not an image bearer of Christ, not an image bearer of God, not a child of God. And here Jesus goes, what would you like me to do for you? He puts himself in that servant position under Bartimaeus. He treats him as an image bearer of God. And I, I think at, at that point, something happens in his heart of where he knows what it is like to be treated as a child of God, which is why he responds by following Jesus from this point onwards. Do you see that? What we want is our momentary, our everyday needs to be fixed by Christ. But Jesus goes deeper than that to help us with our deepest, deepest needs, to know that we are loved to know that we are valued, to know that we are children of God. Bartimaeus isn't just dying from being blind. He's dying from being treated as lesser. And the first person who treats him as a human being is the God-man who has come to die for all of us and give us life to the fullest. Which gives me, brings me to my final point. What do you want? We just said a second ago that it's really hard for us to articulate what we want to say what is in our hearts, to say what we'd like to have in the next 10 years. So I've got a couple of application points for you to think about in the, in the coming week. Number one, as you think about what you want, know your desires matter. You see here in this passage, Jesus repeatedly asks people, what do they want? That's a wonderful thing. And I know, I know you're gonna say, oh, I would love to have a house, I would love to have this, I would love to have that, I would love to be able to build my own business or whatever it is that your, your wants is, and you're gonna go, but, but God's will be done, not mine. Do you know when Jesus did that in the Garden of Gethsemane, that was a long process, that Jesus spent hours, hours praying with God the Father, I'm about to die on the cross, please Lord, would you take that away from me? Please Lord, would you help me in these situations? I would really like to not be nailed to a cross, it would be great not to have to go through this. He sweats blood in that process, and then at the end of it, he says, not my will be done, but yours. Which means even if you have selfish desires, 
even if they're as boneheaded as the disciples were here, and it was boneheaded, it's good for us to know that your desires matter to God. He cares about them, doesn't he? Secondly, you're, you may not want what you think. The disciples were boneheaded. They did want the wrong things. And Jesus does not rebuke them. He gently, kindly shows them that in time, they will also suffer for the cross. That in time, they will also follow their creator in these ways. And for us, as we bring our requests towards God, as we say what we want, it's okay for us to know we might get it wrong and to bring that to Jesus. Our third practical point is that Jesus sees our deepest desires. Bartimaeus shouted for help and Jesus puts himself under his service. And the last one is that we can always call out to Jesus. Do you, do you notice those two points were repeated? What can I do for you, Jesus said to the disciples. What can I do for you, Jesus said to Bartimaeus. Why is it repeated? Because Mark is showing us something here. He's showing us that actually the person who is more spiritually blind is not Bartimaeus, it's the disciples, the people who've been walking with Jesus forever, because they think they're pretty impressive. But what does Bartimaeus do? He humbles himself enough to cry out to Jesus. I think that's a huge challenge for us in Manchester because as I look around this room, as I think about some people who are online, you are incredibly competent people. You work hard at what you do. You think through things really well. And maybe you got by in your studies by just researching and working hard. Maybe you did actually build a business by just putting, pulling your bootstraps up and going as best as you can. Maybe you do have wonderful relationships because you've invested in them and you've done as best as you can. And then coming towards this Christianity thing, you think, let me just do this by my own effort. Let me just really get this going. I don't need to humble myself and cry out to Jesus. And yet what we see here is that we must, we must start with a place of where we humble ourselves to call out in our needs towards Christ. What do you want? Why don't you bring it to Jesus? Why don't you chat it through with him? Why don't you see that he gives you your deepest desires? And why don't you continue to call out to him? Look, City Church, at what God has already done at the cross. Note that he now reigns on high and that through his spirit, he continues to ask you, what do you want each day? He cares about your issues that are going on in your life, and you can talk to him through it. It'd be so helpful for us to do that. Let me pray, and then we'll respond. Father, we thank you that you are not a God who is after people to just obey as robots and just be servants. You do call us to serve, but you first put yourself in the position of a servant and you are one who has told us that you love us, that you have sacrificed yourself for us, that you have been a ransom for us, and you have given yourself so that we can enjoy you forever. Lord, as we think about the different things that we want in life, our different desires, some of them which draw us away from you, would you help us to engage with you, to talk to you, and to in that process realize how you are more worthy than anything else and to delight in you all the more. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.